Good evening. Thank you for joining us for Get the Word Out. My name is Lisa Thomas, and tonight's theme is Black History Month. My guests this evening are Lelling B. Boyce and Terry Turner. In celebration of Black History Month, Lelling B. Boyce, singer and storyteller, will share some historical African American traditions derived from her program titled Rock of My Soul. This program is a celebration of African American spirituals and folk tales that appeals to both children and adults and offers sing alongs, some tears, and lots of laughter. Half of the program is storytelling, and two of the spirituals are woven around many dramas. Dialect is used liberally, a la Zora Neale Hurston. This show flows seamlessly while illuminating what throbs at the heart of, African -American, of the African American experience. Rock of My Soul is described as spellbinding and as a show for all Americans. Please welcome Lelling B. Boyce, who will open our show by telling the story, Burr Possum's Dilemma. Thank you, Lelling B. And thank you. Actually, I'm only going to excerpt a portion of this story for you. I first heard this story from Jackie Torrance, a nationally famous storyteller, and I've adapted it to fit my style. Now, in this story, you'll hear me speak with three voices. I'll be the narrator, I'll be Burr Possum, and I'll be Burr Snake. And I'm starting somewhere in the middle, but I think you will catch the flavor very readily. Burr Possum tiptoed up to that large hole. And when he got to the edge, he peeked in. But no sooner did he peek in than he jumped back, cause lying on the bottom of that hole, with a brick on his back, was old Burr Snake. And old Burr Possum said to himself, I best get on out of here, cause old Burr Snake is mean, evil, and low down too. And if an eye gets to sticking around here, he just might get to snapping and biting and carrying on. So old Burr Possum tiptoed away from the hole and started back down the road. But unbeknownst to him, old Burr Snake had already seen him. And old Burr Snake commences to call him out. Help me, we're possum. Oh, no. Burr Snake must have seen me. What you reckon he wants? Well, old Burr Possum's kind heart took him back to that hole to see what old Burr Snake wanted. Burr Snake. But uh, Snake, was that you were calling me? What you want? And Bird Snake replied, I've been down in this hole a mighty long time. And this brick on my back is a killing my spine. Won't you kindly come down and take this brick off in my back? Uh, Birthday, uh, birthday. No, I will not get down in that hole and take that brick off in your back. You know, and I know, if I were to get down in that hole and start to lifting that brick off in your back, you wouldn't do nothing but. Fight me, show sure enough. Maybe not. Maybe not. And that concludes 
my per portion from Burr Possum's Dilemma. It gives you a good idea of how that story flows. And now I would like to share with you one of the audience participation numbers from my show. There are two audience participation numbers. One is a story, and one is a very well-known spiritual, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Now, this spiritual was once considered the most beloved spiritual in the world. It is the song of a dying slave. But it is a joyous song because the slave is looking forward to being relieved of the trials and tribulations of a cruel and brutal world. So the chariot in this song is very sweet indeed. I'm going to use my instrument here, a pitch pipe, to get my note. I think I have given you a taste of my program, and at this point, I'll sit down. Thank you very much, Lelling. We enjoyed that very much. I would now like to feature Terry Turner. Terry Turner is a professor at Yuba Community College in Woodland, and he will be talking to us today about the African American, about Black History Month and the African American diaspora, and how art can be used to tell a historical story about the African-American experience. Can you tell us, um, give us some overview of what your feelings are about how paintings can tell the story of the history of African-Americans? Oh, well, uh, paintings have been part of uh, the experience of all people in Western society, particularly African-Americans in the diaspora, as it um, slavery sort of encompassed of who we are in the United States and uh, a little as is known but uh, African American artists have been working since the on since they stepped foot in uh, this country and um, much of the art that was done during slavery times a lot of it was done by African Americans quilting a lot of the architecture sculpture uh, metal work and uh, many things like that. Well, this, this work has transpired through the generations to present. And uh, we, myself and uh, people even following me in the uh, process of my son and uh, many others. Um, art has been a way for us to express ourselves, just like we have here in storytelling. We use it in terms of a visual narrative and uh, discussion of uh, our families and and uh, our um, the expression of uh, gender all of the different questions that we may have with each other and uh, the community in uh, these modern times 
do you suppose people, uh, particularly African Americans in artistic expression, utilize this as a tool for healing? Would you like to mm -hmm. talk about that? What kinds of representation do you see in works of others? And I know that you do artwork yourself, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. what, what kinds of expressions do you see, or, or what kind of feelings do you get when you view um, the works of African Americans in terms of suffrage and, and where we were then and what we've come to now? Well, in looking at the work, if you, you can always uh, get a sense through the imagery, through the use of color, textures, of how people felt, uh, how they, they, uh, uh, they felt in bondage and, and how they felt in their own freedom. Um, art allows you a particular freedom that, uh, that you have no matter what. So uh, an artist has a general freedom that is innate in just the process of doing it. So African-American artists have always used that in order to have that freedom, whether they was uh, historically, say, in bondage or whatever it may be. We always have been free through the art. And uh, I think you used the word healing. Yes. Yeah, it, it allows us that opportunity to heal. And I uh, think about, um, you find a, uh, through the process of art, we found ways to do spiritual renewal Maybe not religious in the classical sense, but a spiritual sense of renewal. Uh, I always remember the uh, story that my great-grandmother told me that uh, God is in the water and the trees and the sun and in every human being, you know? I mean, often we hear stories of looking for God or something out there, and she told me, no, it's, it's here in everything. And it's not in buildings or in books, it's in people and, and life itself and the energy. And you can express that in art. Uh, a lot of the early artists were landscape painters, and I believe that's a lot of the reason for doing so. And uh, Banneker, and uh, many others that I've seen. And they have been uh, the people that has impressed me the most. And uh, using the landscape as a quilt, and the quilt uh, that we are on and keeps us warm, and also that we are part of, and project the art through that. Okay. Let's take a look at some of your paintings. Can you tell us, before we look at these clips, what inspires <coughs> you to paint, and specifically the works we're about to look at? Well, what inspires me to paint is a lot of, uh, it's my way to find my own personal freedom and expression. That uh, My life is pretty impacted with things throughout the day and the week, with social issues and community issues and being a teacher. But my art allows me the time to see who Terry is mm -hmm. and find that, that expression, which I can't do otherwise. And I can find a quiet, peaceful time within that and be able to develop these things, and that's what I do. Okay. Okay. Um, so what, what do we have here? Can you tell us a little bit about this piece, when you created it, what types of uh, materials you used, and what what propelled you to create this work of art? And what is it titled? It's called The Blue Hole. This is actually after another painting called The Blue Hole, The Little Miami, which is uh, in Cincinnati at the museum there. I, I, my mother, I'm from Cincinnati, and my mother uh, used to take me to the museum. Uh, we'd go downtown and go shopping at Penny's and head off to the museum. And so I was a pretty lucky kid. The museum wasn't far from me in my neighborhood. And so we would go there, and I remember this painting. Um, I decided... Of, huh? what, what types of materials did you use here? Oh, this is acrylic on canvas, mm -hmm. and um, it's a pretty large canvas, and using acrylic paint. Okay. Um, how about if we look at another one? Um, what's this one titled? Uh, we Are Not Afraid. I was working on this. I had been working on a uh, mural in Oakland. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, Judy Houck, and I, we worked together, my son, and uh, uh, this young lady, her last name is uh, Holmes, mm -hmm. Charles Holmes' daughter, mm -hmm. uh, Meredith. We worked on this down there, and uh, afterwards I needed something to work and get back into this with. So I used that, uh, that face in the back, sort of Madonna, as a projection into this. And uh, I also like to use collage material. 
and so forth. So uh, I collage images of family and history and other things out of my experience into these things. And, and how about that figure in the forefront there? Is that a figure of somebody looking on, or yeah, that's two figures? Two figures, sort of holding. Oh, on I see. And the suggestion of uh, like it unity. takes two as unity. It takes two people to really be not afraid. You can't be, you know. I believe that it takes. Uh, there's always two. Mm -hmm. I don't really see finding. Uh, I, I just think the human being and myself, or all of us, we need to, in some way, to work. It's either me and the community, me and the audience, or me and something. Mm -hmm. So that's what I use that as images of. They are faceless, and they're just two human figures that I've painted mm -hmm. with a bird as well. Okay. All right, we're ready to look at another mm -hmm. one. Did you have another picture, of another painting for us to look at? Yeah, there's this one. Okay, what's this? This one's called At One Minute. Or I took it out of a a book it was usually they were talking about atonement and I changed it to a one with, to be at one with stuff and this again I used the images of a well scene mm -hmm. you know the biblical well yeah. I don't know why I came to this but I plant I sort of made this well and this water was frothing and I thought at one point that I should smooth it up but I left it in a frothing way and then again I put symbols in there of Africa and uh, I believe there's my son in there, and my grandson, and some other images in there. I, um, it's my way to introduce my son and everybody to my family. Ah. Anyway. What about the green shrubbery there? Is there any special signification there? Uh, well, I, uh, I grew up in Ohio, and we have a lot of green shrubbery around. It always makes me feel at home. Mm. And it's sort of like a, a womb, a comfort zone. And so I sort of go in there and I like to work with the vegetation and the shrubbery okay. and also uh, I always thought water and shrubbery always smells good you know so it's my way to do that okay um, can you tell us how you employ um, artistic representation with regard to freedom in your uh, work that you do at Yuba Community College as a professor what kind of guidance would you give students in terms of expressing themselves as free individuals? Well, I tell them the first step, I think, is to not make uh, opinions or, or make, a, make an idea of what they think something should be, but allow it to be what it is and just go there because I believe that our opinions limit us in, try, in exploring and finding our visions or finding out new things that we can go to. And I think uh, art is a process of exploration, like life. And that's what I try to tell them. And in closing, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of Black History Month, what do you think is the most significant contribution um, artistically individuals can make? What would your recommendation be for, for cultural expression, given that it's Black History Month? What, visual art? Yeah, visual art. Oh, I think that uh, it's, it's, it, it's a way that encapsulates our present and uh, our past, and it, it's a way of recording it, and I think that it's, it's, uh, to be a visual historian is a wonderful thing to do. I mean, it's something that lasts, and uh, at least as long as a painting lasts, <laughs> and maybe nothing is permanent, but the idea that at least you can do something and uh, art is less abstract than writing, in a sense. You know, it's more primal, and so you can really do that. And a lot of people can do that if allowing themselves to do that. Go there. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much mm -hmm. for sharing your artistic thoughts with mm -hmm. us, Professor Terry Turner. Mm -hmm. uh, I would now like to turn back to Lelling B. Boyce for another story. This one is titled no more auction block. Would you like to give us an introduction to the story? Okay. Um, this is really a song. And in my program, I present two versions of no more auction block for me. Now, the most frequently heard version is very slow. And um, that was the one I initially heard, but the one I'd like to share with you is one that 
arose before the slower, quieter one arose. It, it was sung as a marching song by freed slaves who had joined up with Union forces. It was a song of triumph. So I'll give you a brief taste of No More Auction Block for Me as a marching song. <laughs> Now, following emancipation, we had the Reconstruction era, and out of that era, that marching song you just heard became a slow, mournful statement. But I will sit down now. Thank you for sharing that with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Terry, can you tell us a little bit more about what Black History Month means to you? Do you have any family traditions or have you been to any events in the Davis community lately surrounding the celebration of Black History Month? Well, actually I haven't, except I did go to the uh, exhibition that they had in Sacramento. I think it's still going on. The one that's uh, an exhibition of African American art that mm -hmm. goes over two centuries. And uh, that's a pretty beautiful show. And uh, besides the one that I did, and uh, but much smaller than that in scale. But I really haven't done very much. This is my first uh, thing that I've done. And most of the time I've been working and celebrating Black History Month by teaching people and uh, being and doing that is my expression. Why don't you tell us about your show? You have an art show that's showing at the Woodland Community College Library mm -hmm. on Gibson Road. What yeah. types of works do you have on display there? Well, the three pieces that we've uh, shown here mm -hmm. and several others, they're all that sort of thing. My, uh, my paintings have been for the past 25 or years or more have been uh, visual narratives on this uh, landscape, which I consider a quilt, so to speak. And, uh, and that's what they're about. So they're about the, uh, that issue. And, being able to explore all of the all of our gifts and um, being able to explore uh, the wholeness and richness of a, of a culture which uh, gets unsaid except for once a, once a year during this month so <laughs> I'm always happy to do that and um, I, I've always enjoyed uh, February because it's a, a time that I can express and share, but I believe in multiculturalism, so I uh, have this opportunity by teaching at a community college that I can infuse my classes for 25 years with this stuff all the time. So I celebrate African American History Month all my life and every day, and that's what I do. Well, thank you very much. Can I share something? Yes, please do. I caught a show this past weekend that was a delightful surprise. Uh, it appears we have in Davis, um, in residence at the university in the music department, one of the rising young piano stars in the United States. And she was part of a black history celebration. Her name is Lara Downs, and um, she was the lead performer in a program called I Too Sing America, mm. which um, gave um, some of the writings of the Harlem Renaissance uh, set to music. And um, there were two other very distinguished musicians who came in for the program. But I, I would also like to add that um, I will be performing again this week, February 22nd, 3.30 p.m. at the Davis Senior Center and everyone's welcome. You don't have to be a senior to come. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Will this be the Rock of My Soul program? Yes, Is this it will the be standard Rock program? of My Soul, mm -hmm. a celebration of African-American spirituals and folk tales. Mm -hmm. okay. And you'll get the full show on Thursday. Okay. <laughs> Not just excerpts. Well, 
Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I'd like to turn back to you, uh, Terry, a little bit more about Black History Month. Mm -hmm. Have you ever taught any African American history classes in your curriculum in um, high school or at the community college level? Or what sorts of cultural uh, materials and, and topics do you insert? I know I've taken one of your classes at Yuba Community College. It seemed like the program that you offered there was was very culturally rich. How do you insert um, African American culture in your curriculum at the community college level now? Mm -hmm. Well, how I do that is I insert uh, things through literature, music, and visual art, and uh, just general history. And I like to express uh, sort of political and economic discussions in my humanities classes. Also, um, I get to share them sometimes personal issues that I've had. Uh, or my, uh, my family were musicians and uh, poets as well. And so I've had all of that. I'm able to share a lot of that with them. But years ago, when I first started teaching, I taught at the Experimental College at the university. And I think I taught at the first African-American history class at UC Davis or in this community. So I did that. And I've been infusing and working these things as much as possible. But I like to try to, in doing so, I evoke a lot of different cultures mm -hmm. in that. Because uh, in, in the history of Langston Hughes, who had traveled all over the world and down through Mexico and Central America and Africa and Europe, I mean, I've traveled there as well. So I'm able to share some of these things with them and do that. I think some of the richest things I've ever found was uh, um, down on the Atlantic coast in Guatemala and El Salvador. African culture is still there in beautiful ways. Oh my. I'm able to share that with students, pictures of the art and discussions in, in terms of discussing uh, Western art and humanities. How about in the student organizations? I know that at Yuba College I was in the Black Student Union, is that still active at the Yuba Community uh, College? No, it's, it's not very active right now. We've been having a struggle. Um, it's, it's somewhat active in Marysville, but in Woodland it's, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's gotten, it, I would like to see it grow. It, it's not, um, we, uh, we used to have a director, Marion Shivers, who helped keep that sort of thing alive, and she's now in Marysville, so I don't have any support much for doing that. Mm -hmm. to, at least that helped. I have support, but uh, teaching six classes makes it a little difficult. I need some students to help me. That would be ideal, and often we do. But we're getting together uh, African-American uh, experience in education, and so we're developing that within the whole district and trying to bring students to faculty and staff and involve them in that process. As a relative newcomer to this area, I'm curious about what percent of the school population at your school is black? Oh, that's a good question. Probably uh, 1% or mm -hmm. so, especially in, uh, it's growing, though. Mm -hmm. As more uh, African, African-American peoples are moving into this area yeah. from the Bay Area. We're also getting African students from Africa mm -hmm. and African-Americans who are just coming around and they're now deciding to go to the Community college is growing, yeah. but um, Woodland and Davis <coughs> hasn't uh, fostered that kind of climate very well, but it's getting better. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marysville had Beale Air Base up there, so mm -hmm. there was more African Americans because of the Air Force Base. And um, as you know, going north of there it gets a little thin yeah. for African Americans, so we don't have very many people. So <laughs> that's <coughs> it's been difficult. In, in terms of that, but we would like to foster more. Yeah, low people. percentages have good points and bad points they about that. I, I remember when I went to UCB, mm -hmm. we were very low, mm -hmm. but every time a black person saw me, I was greeted so warmly. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful kind of fraternity at the time. Well, there's that. So, yeah. And I, um, the students treat me warmly over there because mm -hmm. I'm the only African-American instructor in the entire district, so wow. I get a warm reception. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, both of you, Professor Terry Turner and singer, storyteller, Lelling B. Boyce, for joining us on the Get the Word Out program, uh, tonight's theme being Black History Month. My name is Lisa Thomas. Thank you for joining us. Good night.